So I'm in the middle of an extensive deep dive into understanding specifically level one autism, mild autism as it might present in those assigned female at birth, sometimes called the female phenotype of autism, although we know anyone can have this profile. I have just finished the book over the weekend, Unmasking Autism. I've been reading a ton of research articles, uh, ordered several more books. I'm still reading Neurotribes. But as someone who specializes in complex PTSD, I've felt for a long time now, when I talk so much about toxic hypervigilance and silent trauma and sensory issues that people have asked, and I've also really wondered how much of this with the overlapping could be related to not just the trauma that is often inherent and in, in having autism for many people, but to how it presents. So I'm gonna make, I'm posting a long video on this on my YouTube channel tomorrow, and I will say I'm at the very beginning of this really as a, not just a clinician, but as a human, and I want to share it with you. And um, it's helping me put a lot of pieces together, but an article I found that was really interesting, and it has some linked research, is five signs you may be a woman with level one or mild autism. And here's what they are. Number one, you've been labeled as highly sensitive. Now the HSP has often been debated as, is it a profile of autism, is it not? but the idea that you have always identified as being highly sensitive is number one. Number two, you prefer a lot of alone time and or only with a few people at a time. And so we're gonna talk more about that. I've talked a lot about isolating in terms of managing our nervous systems, but it's interesting to think about how that might be related and not related in terms of how a person, how their brain responds to interactions with others and their environment. Number three, having a special interest in psychology, the arts or sciences, and potentially there being a very you know, common dynamic where those of us who have our special interests are in psychology, there may be a lot more of us as therapists who may or may not fall into this category. Obviously being previously diagnosed with things like depression, anxiety, BPD, PTSD, obviously a lot of times too, those things don't work. They're not effective. The treatments don't work. And I think this is another really important reason to do a deep dive. And lastly, having a likelihood of having autoimmune disease, allergies, and things of that nature. That is definitely something that I personally relate to. I wanna just say that please be gentle. This is the beginning of my journey and understanding it as a clinician and as just a, a woman who has tried to make sense of all these things. And I do believe we are really truly are at the very beginning of understanding the neurodivergency and impacts of neurodivergency on our lives and relationships and mental and physical health. So I'm gonna start posting more about this, but um, I hope you'll join me and help you know, maybe understand yourself more too. Okay, first of all, I wanna say that I appreciate all of you who are here with me on this journey to understand specifically, this is my goal, the intersection between complex PTSD and high masking individuals on the autism spectrum who were assigned female at birth because there are so many women being late diagnosed. And as somebody who is an ex expert, I would say generally in complex PTSD, I have been wondering for a long time, I mean, I understand that I could put graphics up here and I could tell you what the research says, but I wanted to become more of an expert in what it might look like from the autism side, if especially if you were high masking, especially because I think that we're understanding, I think the very, just like we're at the very beginning of understanding the relationship between trauma and autism and how all of that might show up in misdiagnoses of borderline, of narcissism, what's the role that ADHD plays? And it's really scary. I wanted to, you know, I've been doing a ton of research. I have a long way to go. Um, I typically want to like know it all and present it. And I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. This is a personal journey for me as well. And so it's really vulnerable and scary. Like when I posted the last video saying the word mild, it was because the article that I used, used that word. And I recognize that's not a great word choice. And I appreciate you letting me know that. I knew that words like high functioning and low functioning weren't preferred. I thought in many articles on books said levels were preferred. And then I read levels aren't preferred. You're, you're autistic or not. I think the problem is so many of us as clinicians, we are not trained in autism unless we seek out specific trainings. We are not. 
And that, in that sense, I wouldn't even trust, like someone said, I asked my therapist if I could have autism and if we're talking about high masking, I might say, unless they're a specialist, I wouldn't necessarily trust their response. And that's just my opinion because of all that I'm learning right now and all the videos I watch and the articles I'm reading. And so I just want to say that if you're someone on the spectrum, please like hold me accountable and, and share and teach, but also make space for the fact that um, we can't become experts unless we're willing to make mistakes and learn and put ourselves out there. And this is something that I really do want to understand. And I understand now that I mean, trauma is inherent for most people with autism. And I've had people post on my videos and say, hey, Dr. Sage, have you checked out what used to be called Asperger's uh, for yourself? And um, it's like a scary thing to even consider. I, like I said, I didn't want to do this because I thought, oh, that's too vulnerable, but that's exactly why I want to do it. I want to take you with me on this journey. And yes, I've been up since 4 a.m. Thank you, hashtag menopause. I think that's a whole other conversation about menopause and autism potentially in complex trauma. But I'm so glad you're here. I hope you'll join me and please have some compassion when I screw up, but also feel free to hold me accountable. I'm learning so much about the dynamics between high masking autism, specifically as it relates to complex PTSD and how those two in general, autism and trauma seem to just hold hands. But one of the things I came across, which really relates to how much I talk about complex trauma in Dr. Devin Price's book called Unmasking Autism is the concept of fawning. Now, if you know a lot about complex trauma, you know that fawning, first discussed by Pete Walker in his book on complex PTSD, is really about trying to make yourself less threatening by being appealing to the threat. Except for in many cases, in terms of childhood trauma, that threat is often our own parents or our caregivers. And so we're trying to rotate around them and sort of mirror back that outside in orientation where we sort of read them first and then decide how to respond. And it's got me thinking about this fawning, let's say in a complex PTSD family with a lot of like eggshell parents and the concept of this masking and fawning in autism, how difficult it would be to separate those, especially if let's say you were, you, were, you, know, you came into the world with autism genetically and now you are in a childhood where it actually benefits you to do those two things, to mask for your own self in terms of safety and to mask in terms of finding ways to be more acceptable like no matter what so in his book there's a graphic and he talks about fawning and compulsive people pleasing and i talk so much about compulsive caretaking and complex trauma and it's he says that people with autism tend to fawn because it earns the autistic person praise it offers a false promise of acceptance it simplifies complicated relationship dynamics, right? If I just take myself out of it and make it about you, it flattens social interactions into one easy rule, always say yes. Validates the autistic person's belief they should ignore their feelings and needs and minimizes conflict and reduces anger. And that just feels really difficult to, to sort of map out how do you start to look at you know why your fawning behaviors are what they are of course what i'm trying to do now is is get back to the roots and understanding the side of asd not just the side of complex trauma as it overlaps and then what's fascinating is thinking about regardless of asd or complex ptsd this is a response to trauma, to not being able to be your real and full self because for, for whatever reasons, that's not possible. And how we take these patterns and they affect every single areas of our life where we don't even necessarily know how to show up as who we are. Uh, it's just interesting, you know? Autistic women and gender minorities. Most of the writing and research about gender-based disparities in autism focuses on the fact that girls are woefully underdiagnosed. Researchers, therapists, and even some autistic self-advocates talk about female autism, pointing to the fact that among girls, autistic qualities do seem less severe or obvious on average. When autistic girls engage in self-stimulatory behavior, it tends to be less physically damaging less arm biting, more hair twirling or opening and closing a book quietly many times. 
When autistic girls are shy and withdrawn, people are less concerned by it than they would be if a boy exhibited the same reticence. On the flip side, when autistic girls have meltdowns, it tends to get written off as an emotional outburst. When they do act out or behave aggressively, they're more likely to be punished severely for not being ladylike, resulting in them learning to censor their aggression at an earlier age than most boys do. Adults speak to young girls using more emotion-related words than they do when speaking to boys. Autistic girls often get a leg up in social and relational skills. Much of the play that girls stereotypically engage in and are encouraged to engage in involves mimicking adult social interactions, such as playing house or pretending to run a store. As a result, many autistic girls learn how to fake their way through routine conversations at a younger age than boys do. For these and a variety of other reasons, girls, autistic girls are assessed and diagnosed at later ages, at older ages. Many are diagnosed as adults or are never diagnosed at all. Below is a table summarizing some of the most well-known female autism traits. It's adapted from a list originally published on the now defunct site, Help for Asperger's, which was maintained by the author of the girls, Asper Girls, Rudy Simone, and is by no means an exhaustive list and shouldn't be taken as a diagnostic tool. As I've already mentioned, the idea that all women have female autism is a reductive one. Still, clinicians often fall back on tables like these to determine if an adult woman might potentially be an undiagnosed autistic. So here are some things to be cognizant of. Traits commonly associated with female autism. Next video. If someone is aware that a phenomenon such as female autism exists, they're often taught it looks something like this. These are the traits commonly associated with female autism. Number one, emotional. Strikes others as emotionally immature and sensitive. Prone to outbursts or crying jacks, sometimes over seemingly small things. Has trouble recognizing or naming one's feelings. Ignores or suppresses emotions until they bubble up and explode. May become disturbed or overwhelmed when others are upset but uncertain how to respond or support them. Goes blank and seems to shut down after prolonged socializing or when overstimulated. These are the psychological issues. Reports a high degree of anxiety, especially social anxiety. Is perceived by others as moody and prone to bouts of depression. May have been diagnosed with mood disorders such as bipolar or PDs like borderline or narcissistic PD before autism was discovered. Fears rejection intensely and tries to manage how other people uh, how other people feel to avoid it. Has an unstable sense of self, perhaps highly dependent on the opinions of others. These are the behavioral symptoms. Uses control to manage stress. Follows intense self-imposed rules, despite having an otherwise unconventional personality. Is usually happiest at home or in a familiar, predictable environment seems youthful for their age in looks, dress, behavior, or interests, prone to excessive exercise, calorie restriction, or other eating disordered behaviors, neglects physical health until it becomes impossible to ignore, self-soothes by constantly fidgeting, listening to repetitive music, twirling hair, picking skin, or cuticles, social, is a social chameleon, adopts the mannerisms and interests of the groups they're in, may be highly self-educated, but will have struggled with social aspects of the college or career, can be very shy or mute, and yet can become very outspoken when discussing a subject they are passionate about, struggles to know when to speak in large groups or at parties, does not initiate conversations, but can appear outgoing and comfortable when approached, can socialize, but primarily in shallow, superficial ways that may seem like a performance, struggles to form deeper friendships, has trouble disappointing or disagreeing with someone during a real-time conversation. Now this type can apply to anyone and they talk about this, saying that there's a particular way the neurotype tends to present among people who are discovered late in life as autistic. We tend to be emotionally withdrawn yet friendly and socially adaptive. We're social chameleons and masters at making people like us, but we never let much of our real selves show. We erect rigid rules around our lives to manage stress and make an unpredictable social world feel less scary. Okay, let's get into Samantha Kraft's list to help inform everyday practitioners about 
possible profiles and diagnostic criteria that are not in the DSM-5, but that might reflect a profile of autism. I'm a licensed psychologist. This person is not a licensed mental health professional, but does have a advanced degree in education. And many, many, many autistic people have shared that these lists that she has created are very helpful. So let's get into it. Now she says to check all areas that strongly apply if each area has between 75 to 80 percent of the statements or more that are basically endorsed or checked yes you may want to consider that the person may be autistic so i am not saying that these traits make you autistic i'm just giving you more data from the autistic voices in the community that i'm listening to in lots of places research articles websites podcasts to help you understand yourself more and to talk about this topic more okay let's get started also, don't forget that in any diagnosis like this, they're going to be looking at a much larger picture, childhood history, you know, social history, relational histories. There's going to be a lot more than also just these traits. Okay, let's go. The first area is deep thinkers. Number one, a deep thinker, a prolific writer or artist drawn to poetry or art. Highly intelligent. Don't forget, highly intelligent does not relate to IQ levels. Autistic individuals are often dyslexic and have dysgraphia and other learning disabilities, but can be highly intelligent in particular subject matters. So the next one is sees things at multiple levels, including her own thinking processes, analyzes existence, the meaning of life and everything continually. Serious and matter of fact in nature, doesn't take things for granted, doesn't simplify, everything is complex, and often gets lost in one's own thoughts and checks out like a blank stare. Section B, innocent, naive, honest, experiences trouble with lying, finds it difficult to understand manipulation and disloyalty, finds it difficult to understand vindictive behavior and retaliation, easily fooled and conned, feelings of confusion and being overwhelmed, Feelings of being misplaced and or from another planet. Feeling like an alien. I've talked about that a lot. Feelings of isolation. Abused or taken advantage of as a child but didn't think to tell anyone. Go to part two. Part two of Samantha Craft's list on what can create potentially an autistic profile. Let's keep going to part C. Section C, escape and friendship. Survives overwhelming emotions and senses by escaping in thought or action. Escapes regularly through fixations, obsessions, and over-interest in subjects. Escapes routinely through imagination, fantasy, and daydreaming. Escapes through mental processing. Escapes through the rhythm of words. Philosophizes continually. Had imaginary friends in youth. Imitates people on television or in movies. Treated friends as pawns in youth. Example, friends were students, consumers, members. Makes friends with older or younger females more so than friends her age, often in, often in young adulthood. Imitates friends or peers in style, dress, attitude, interests, and manner, sometimes speech. Obsessively collects and organizes subjects. Mastered imitation. Escapes by playing the same music over and over say the same movies also, escapes through a relationship, real or imagined. Numbers bring ease. Numbers could be, could be numbers associated with patterns, calculations, list time, and or personification. Escapes through counting, categorizing, organizing, rearranging. Escapes into other rooms at parties. Cannot relax or rest without many thoughts. Everything has a purpose. Part three of Samantha Craft's list on helping to identify possible profiles of autism. So now we're onto the comorbid attributes. So what things tend to co-occur with, with them, whatever else is going on, which may be part of the spectrum for a person. Okay, OCD, sensory issues, sight, sound, texture, smells, taste, might have synesthesia, generalized anxiety, sense of pending danger or doom, feelings of polar extremes, depressed, Overjoyed, inconsiderate, oversensitive, poor muscle tone, double jointed, and or lack in coordination, may have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Hiptonia or Potts syndrome, eating disorders, food obsessions, and or worry about what is eaten, 
irritable bowel and or intestinal issues, chronic fatigue and or immune challenges, misdiagnosed with a mental illness, experiences physical symptoms, perhaps labeled, perhaps labeled hypochondriac, sorry, questions place in the world, often drops small objects, wonders who she is and what is expected of her, searches for right and wrong, since puberty has had bouts of depression, may have PMDD, flicks, rubs, fingernails, picks, scalp, skin, flaps hands, rubs hands together, tucks hands under or between legs, keeps closed fists, paces in circles, and or clears throat often. Part four of Samantha Craft's list on helping those of us understand what a possible presentation of autism might look like in females. Okay, let's go to social interactions, section E. Friends have ended friendships suddenly without female AS understanding why and or difficult time making friends, so friendship issues. Tendency to overshare, spills intimate details to strangers, raised hand too much in class or didn't participate in class, little impulse control when with speaking when younger, monopolizes conversation at times, brings subject back to self, comes across as narcissistic and controlling, is not narcissistic, shares in order to reach out, often sounds eager and overzealous or apathetic and disinterested, holds a lot of thoughts, ideas, and feelings inside, feels as if she is attempting to communicate correctly, Obsesses about the potentiality of a relationship with someone, particularly a love interest or feasible new friendship. Confused by the rules of accurate eye contact, tone of voice, proximity of body, body stance and posture in conversation. Conversations are often exhausting. Questions the actions and behaviors of self and others continually. Feels as if missing a conversation gene, feels like they're missing a conversation gene or thought filter. Trained self in social interactions through reading and studying other people. Visualizes and practices how she will act around others. Practices, rehearses in mind what she will say to another before entering the room. Difficulty filtering out background noise when not talking to others. Sorry, when talking to others. Difficulty filtering out background noise when talking to others. It's like you can hear everyone. Has continuous dialogue in mind that tells her what to say and how to act in a social situation. Sense of humor sometimes seems quirky, odd, inappropriate, or different from others. As a child, it was hard to know when it was her turn to talk. Finds norms of conversation confusing. Finds unwritten and unspoken rules difficult to grasp, remember, and apply. Part five, finds refuge when alone. Feels extreme relief when doesn't have to go anywhere, talk to anyone, answer calls, or leave the house, but at the same time will often harbor guilt for hibernating and not doing what everyone else is doing. One visitor in the home may be perceived as a threat. This can even be a family member or friend. Knowing logically a house visitor is not a threat doesn't still relieve the anxiety. Feelings of dread about upcoming events and appointments on the calendar. Knowing she has to leave the house causes anxiety from the moment she wakes up. All the steps involved in leaving the house are overwhelming and exhausting to think about. She prepares herself mentally for outings, excursions, meetings, and appointments, often days before a scheduled event. OCD tendencies when it comes to concepts of time, being on time, tracking time, recording time, and managing time could be carried over to money as well. Questions next steps and movements continually. Sometimes feels as if she's on a stage being watched and or a sense of always having to act out the right steps even when she's at home alone. Telling the self the right words and or positive talk like CBT doesn't typically alleviate anxiety. CBT may cause increased feelings of inadequacy. Knowing she is staying home all day brings great peace of mind. Requires a large amount of down or alone time. Feels guilty after spending a lot of time on a special interest uncomfortable in public locker rooms, bathrooms, and or dressing rooms. Dislikes being in a crowd, crowded gym, crowded mall, crowded theater. Okay, let's continue with section G, sensitive. Sensitive to sounds, textures, temperature, and or smells when trying to sleep. Adjust bedclothes, bedding, and or environment in an attempt to find comfort. Dreams are anxiety-ridden, vivid, complex, 
and or precognitive in nature, highly intuitive to others' feelings, highly empathetic, sometimes to the point of confusion, takes criticism to heart, longs to be seen, heard, and understood, questions if she is a normal person, highly susceptible to outsiders' viewpoints and opinions, at times adapts her view of life uh, or actions based on others' opinions or words, recognizes own limitations in many areas of daily life, if not hourly, becomes hurt when others question or doubt her work, views many things as an extension of self, fears others' opinions, criticism, and judgment, dislikes words and events that hurt animals and people, collects or rescues animals, often in childhood, huge compassion for suffering, sometimes for inanimate objects, personification, sensitive to substances, environmental toxins, food, alcohol, medication, hormones, etc., tries to help, offers unsolicited advice, or formalizes a plan of action, questions life purpose and how to be a better person, seeks to understand abilities, skills, and or gifts. Okay, section eight, sense of self. Feels trapped between wanting to be herself and wanting to fit in. Imitates others without realizing it. Suppresses true wishes, often in young adulthood. Exhibits codependent behaviors, often in young adulthood. Adapts self in order to avoid ridicule. Rejects social norms and or questions social norms. Feelings of extreme isolation. Feeling good about the self takes a lot of effort and work. Switches preferences based on environment and other people. Switches behavior based on environment and other people. Didn't care about her hygiene, clothes, and appearance before the teenage years and or before someone else pointed these out to her. Freaks out but doesn't know why until later. Young sounding voice. Trouble recognizing what she looks like and or has occurrences of slight difficulty recognizing and remembering faces. Feeling significantly younger on the inside than on the outside. Perpetually feeling 12. Section I, confusion. Had a hard time learning that others are not always honest. Feelings seem confusing, illogical, and unpredictable in the self and others. Confuses appointment times, numbers, and or dates. Expects that, expects that by acting a certain way, certain results can be achieved, but realizes in dealing with emotions, those results don't always manifest. Spoke frankly and literally in youth. Jokes go over the head. Confused when others ostracize, shun, belittle, trick, and betray. Trouble identifying feelings unless they are extreme. Trouble with emotions of hate and dislike. Feels sorry for someone who has persecuted or hurt her. Personal feelings of anger, outrage, deep love, fear, giddiness, anticipation seem to be easier to identify than emotions of joy, satisfaction, calmness, and serenity. Difficulty recognizing how extreme emotions, outrage and deep love will affect her and challenges transferring what has been learned about emotions from one situation to the next. Situations and conversations sometimes are perceived as black or white. The middle spectrum of outcomes, events and emotions is sometimes overlooked or misunderstood. All or nothing mentality. A small fight might signal the end of a relationship or collapse of their world. A small compliment might boost her into a state of bliss. Okay, we're gonna do section J, which is words, numbers, and patterns, and then an optional additional section on executive functioning and motor skills. So let's start with let's start with section J, words, numbers, and patterns. Likes to know word origins and or origin of historical facts, root cause, and foundation. Confused when there is more than one meaning or spelling to a word. High interest in song and song lyrics. Notices patterns frequently. Remembers things in visual pictures. Remembers exact details about someone's life. Has a remarkable memory for certain details. Writes or creates to relieve anxiety. Has certain feelings or emotions towards words or numbers. And words and or numbers bring a sense of comfort and peace akin to a friendship. Now the executive functioning and motor skills, it says, this area isn't always as evident as other areas. Simple tasks can cause extreme hardship. Learning, learning to drive a car or rounding the corner in a hallway can be troublesome. New places often offer their own set of challenges. 
Anything that requires a reasonable amount of steps, dexterity, or know-how can rouse a sense of panic. The thought of repairing, fixing, or locating something can cause anxiety. Mundane tasks are avoided. Cleaning home, uh, cleaning self and home may seem insurmountable. Many questions come to mind when setting about to do a task. Might leave the house with mismatched socks, shirt unbuttoned correctly, and or have dyslexia or dysgraphia. A trip to the grocery store can be overwhelming. Trouble copying dance moves, aerobic moves, or direction in a sports gym class. Has a hard time finding certain objects in the house, but remembers with exact clarity, my dog is having a nightmare, where other objects are. Not being able to locate something or thinking about locating something can cause feelings of intense anxiety, object permanence challenges, even with something as simple as opening an envelope. So this is the unofficial list. It says, this unofficial list can be copied for therapists, counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, professors, teachers, and relatives if, Samantha's, if Samantha Craft's name and contact information remain on the printout. So this list was created in 2012 and updated in 2016. And once again, this is Samantha Craft's list, which is a collection of a lot of history and experiences with those in the community, with her own experiences with ASD. And I believe she has a master's in education. So... As I said in the beginning, these are not meant to be diagnostic tools, but I think they can really inform a picture, especially around high masking and what it might look like in those assigned female at birth for people like me who are psychologists who were literally trained with, with this idea that autism looks like the stereotypical picture of a white male child playing with trains and rocking back and forth. And that is just nowhere near enough of the spectrum being described. So I hope this was helpful. Okay, we're going to do section J, which is words, numbers, and patterns, and then an optional additional section on executive functioning and motor skills. So let's start with just, let's start with section J, words, numbers, and patterns. Likes to know word origins and or origin of historical facts, root cause, and foundation. Confused when there is more than one meaning or spelling to a word. High interest in song and song lyrics. Notices patterns frequently, remembers things in visual pictures, remembers exact details about someone's life, has a remarkable memory for certain details, writes or creates to relieve anxiety, has certain feelings or emotions towards words or numbers, and words and or numbers bring a sense of comfort and peace akin to a friendship. Now the executive functioning and motor skills, it says, this area isn't always as evident as other areas. Simple tasks can cause extreme hardship. Learning, learning to drive a car or rounding the corner in a hallway can be troublesome. New places often offer their own set of challenges. Anything that requires a reasonable amount of steps, dexterity, or know-how can rouse a sense of panic. The thought of repairing, fixing, or locating something can cause anxiety. Mundane tasks are avoided. Cleaning, home, uh, cleaning self and home may seem insurmountable. Many questions come to mind when setting about to do a task. Might leave the house with mismatched socks, shirt unbuttoned correctly, and or have dyslexia or dysgraphia. A trip to the grocery store can be overwhelming. Trouble copying dance moves, aerobic moves, or direction in a sports gym class. Has a hard time finding certain objects in the house, but remembers with exact clarity, my dog is having a nightmare, where other objects are. Not being able to locate something or thinking about locating something can cause feelings of intense anxiety, object permanence challenges, even with something as simple as opening an envelope. So this is the unofficial list. It says, this unofficial list can be copied for therapists, counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, professors, teachers, and relatives if, Samantha's, if Samantha Craft's name and contact information remain on the printout. So this list was created in 2012 and updated in 2016. And once again, this is Samantha Craft's list, which is a collection of a lot of history and experiences with those in the community, with her own experiences with ASD, and I believe she has a master's in education. So as I said in the beginning, these are not meant to be diagnostic tools, but I think they can really inform a picture, especially around high masking and what it might look like in those assigned female at birth for people like me who are psychologists who were literally trained with, with this idea that autism looks like the stereotypical picture of a white male child playing with trains and rocking back and forth. And that is just nowhere near enough of the spectrum being described. So I hope this was helpful.